So welcome. My name is Pastor Hector. I'm excited about what God is doing in, in, in each of your lives and in my life as well. And we're, gonna, we're starting a new series that I'm excited about, that this series is entitled Jesus Is. And each of you should have received, if you came this morning, those of you who are here, should have received some message notes. So you have these notes and you can actually uh, follow along with the message with the notes and, and fill in the blanks. It's a good thing to do. Keeps you uh, attentive and uh, following with me as I go along. So you'll have your message notes. But if you're online, we're starting today with a new platform online. So please look at the bottom. You'll see a section that says notes. And uh, just click on that and you can have your message notes there with you too. So we're excited, like I said, about this new series. It's uh, entitled Jesus Is. And it is, uh, over for the next four weeks, we'll be looking at who is Jesus. And this is a series that we're doing also in, anticipa in anticipation and preparation for what we're calling the Week of Hope and our time of hope where we are asking you to invite your friends, families, and neighbors to Back to Church Sunday, which is the 20th of this month. So what a great time to invite people who may have uh, walked with God and then walked away or may not know who Jesus is. It's a great opportunity for them to hear who is Jesus. So we'll seek to answer that question. Who is he? So before we get started, I'd like you to answer that question. Who is Jesus? Who, who is he to you? I love the fact that it's who is Jesus, not who was Jesus, but who is Jesus. Jesus is, is alive. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And who, who is this Jesus to you? The Apostle Paul reminded the Corinthian church in his first letter to them that when he visited them to announce the wonderful things God had done, he kept his message, he said, plain and simple. He explained who Jesus is and what Jesus did. And using the uh, paraphrased version of the Bible called the message, this is from the message version. Paul writes, you'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you to let you in on God's masterstroke, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy, which so many so many in the world are trying to philosophize their way to heaven. He says, I didn't come to, with polished speeches and the latest philosophy. I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First Jesus and who he is. Who is Jesus? Then Jesus and what he did. Jesus crucified. Being a Christian is simple. It's about following Jesus. It's about knowing Jesus and loving Jesus and giving our lives to Jesus. Once you know him, you can't help but love him. Over the next four weeks, we will together look at the very traits and qualities of Jesus and discover or rediscover for some of us who Jesus really is. Today, we're looking at, and we're calling, I'm calling the message today, Jesus is my best friend. Do you have a best friend? Ask yourself, do you have a best friend? Who is your best friend? And today, we want to look at the fact that, the, sure, the answer, if you want to get the answer right, is Jesus is my best friend. But we also want to look at truth. We want to look at what is what is true for you right now? Do you know Jesus that way as your best friend? You know, uh, when I got married to Chris, it was great. I met this girl at Santa Clara University who loved to play tennis, and she loved to play football. Yes, she loved football. And so I was her football coach, powder puff football there at Santa Clara University. And it was a real hard job. I had to coach 20 freshman women as a junior. I mean, that was really hard. And, but I was out there, and I met my wife, Chrissy. She came one day to 
uh, the practice wearing a tennis skirt and because she played tennis, and so she was wearing the skirt while we were playing football. And I, I, I was a little attracted, and so I uh, ended up getting to know Christy. She's a little embarrassed right now. But, um, but we became the best of friends. We played tennis together. We ended up playing football together. One time I even tackled her after a football game because I was so excited. Um, and she still stayed with me. And we became and have been the best of friends. And so it's just, we've been married for 36 years. But I want you to think about right now, who is your best friend? Who would you say is your best friend? Is it your spouse? Is it somebody you've known all your life? Maybe it's somebody that you've just developed a relationship with recently. But today, we're going to be looking at Jesus and really looking at him and to say, is he my best friend? You know, you might ask the question, especially if you're one of the younger ones among us, how can I have a best friend with no skin? I can't see him. How can he be my best friend? And by the way, didn't this Jesus that you're talking about live over 2,000 years ago? And I thought he died on a cross. So how can he be my best friend? Well, the truth is, and what the Bible makes really clear, and what those of us who have come to know Jesus know, is that Jesus is alive. Jesus rose from the grave and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, preparing to return and claim us. He's coming back again. And so at this church, we say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Because we know the Bible tells us that he's coming back to claim his church. So Jesus is alive, and all of us who believe in him have his spirit living in us. And so Jesus, he can be our best friend because he's always with us if you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior. You know, the Apostle Matthew, one of Jesus' 12 good friends, he tells us that Jesus was given the name of Jesus. He says, she will give birth, this is Matthew 1, 21, Mary, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He was speaking to Joseph. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus is Jesus's given name, the name of Jesus. But you know, Jesus also had another name. And you may even refer to it as a nickname, but he had another name. And Matthew tells us in Matthew 1, 23, that the, he says that the virgin will be with child, that's Mary, and will give birth to a son. And they will call his name Emmanuel. That's not his given name, but it describes who Jesus is, which means God with us. God in the flesh. Emmanuel, that is Jesus' like nickname. You know, when we give people nicknames, it's often because we have a special relationship with them. I remember when I was little and had uh, 10 brothers and sisters in my family, I had a nickname, and it was a name that my mom would call me. And she would call me Hecky. And she'd say, Hecky, come here. And I would love it when my mom called me Hecky because when she called me Hecky, I knew it was because she loved me. And she wanted to share that love with me or she was excited about something I did. And, and uh, so it was, it was great when she would call me Hecky. That was like my nickname, an affectionate name from my parents. But I sure didn't like it when it was Jose Hector Moreno, get over here. And they would, she would use my given name sometimes. And it was like, okay, I know I'm in trouble. But I remember when I was a kid in school and somebody, I think one of my sisters called me Hecky in front of all my friends. Can you believe that? She called me Hecky in front of all my friends. And I thought, don't do that. Don't do that. And sure enough, all day long at school, Hecky, Hecky, Hecky. And, you know, so for those that we know and are close to, a nickname is very special and can be a very special thing. But for those who don't know you, you do not call me Hecky. And I got big at that time, so I was ready to hit whoever called me Hecky. 
that you call me Hector. And, but Jesus, for those of us who know him, know him by Emmanuel, we know that he is God with us, that he is very special to us. You know, Jesus had John as one of his best friends, also one of his disciples who followed him. And John considered himself to be Jesus's best friend. He considered him to be the one that Jesus loved the most. But John tells us in John chapter 1, he says, and the word, which is a, another word for God, he says, and the word, God became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is the only son, of, a son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So John is saying, I'm an eyewitness. I saw God with us. I, we saw God in the form of the man known as Jesus, and he lived with us. We dwelt with him. We, we were with him for three years. And let me tell you that he is God. You know, as we think about this, as I think about who is my best friend, and I had to answer that question as I prepared this week. I had to really ask that question because I love the guys that I know. I've loved the friends, the male friends that I've had, but I can tell you living with somebody and raising five children with somebody and, and just really enjoying my wife and our time together, we, she has always been my best friend. And so this week, just having to spend, as I was seeking with spending time preparing for this message, I started to think about who do I actually talk with the most and, and who knows me the best and and who will love me even though they know everything about me? Je Chrissy knows a lot about me, but she doesn't know every thought that I think. If she did, she may not like me. She may not think I'm all that great. But Jesus knows every thought I think. He knows every thought you think. And he still loves me. And he's still there for me. You know, Chrissy is so forgiving. There are many times over our relationship, over the course of the years that we've had together, that I've sinned against her. And she has forgiven me. But Jesus is more forgiving. His forgiveness cost him his life. He was willing to go to the cross in order to forgive me and to forgive you. What a friend. What a friend. One who would be willing to lay down his life. Tracy talked about Anthony taking a bullet for her and the family. So grateful that he didn't have to do that and doesn't have to do that. But Jesus did, and he did so willingly. Jesus, the very Son of God who could have called legions of angels to defend him, went upon a cross in order to pay for your sins and mine. So he is imminently forgiving. And so as I've thought about this, and I've really spent some time with it, I ask you to spend the same amount of time and just really think about it. Is Jesus my best friend? Can I spend time with him and really discuss anything with him? Can I talk to him like I would talk to a very close and good friend? Do I do that? So the question that we ask is, why did God decide to become a man and go through the birthing process and live a life on earth. Have you ever thought about that? Well, Jesus, you're God. You could have showed up at age 30. You could have done your ministry and proven who you were and then gone to the cross and died on a cross and lived only three years. Why did you decide to be born of a virgin, a virgin who was not married. And why did you decide to grow up and live a life for 30 years before your ministry? Why would you do all that? You know, there is something that I've learned that they study in seminary, and you know I've been to law school, but not seminary. But one thing I've learned is that there is the theology of identification. And that is that by Jesus being born as a baby and going through even the birthing process. Can you imagine that? The God of the universe had to go through the birth canal 
and live as a baby completely at the, at the mercy of, of this world and completely dependent upon his mom. And he did that. Why? Why would he do that? Today we're going to learn that he, the Bible tells us that he did that so that we might be able to identify with him, knowing that he can identify with us, that there's nothing that we have gone through or will go through that he himself did not experience. He was born into the world. He had a mother, Mary, who at the time when she was pregnant with him was not yet married to Joseph. He was born a Jew. He lived for 30 years in the Middle East. And as far as we know, during that entire life, that 30-year period before his public ministry, he didn't perform one miracle. The Bible tells us that his miracle at Cana was his first miracle. And it's amazing that during the time that he, before his public, even during his public ministry, but that during the time that he lived before he died, his family... His own family did not believe in him. And Jesus, it says he was tempted in every way, just like the rest of us, yet without sin. Can, can he identify with your struggle and mine? Why was he made a man and not an angel? Why, why, was, why wouldn't he come as an angel instead of a man? It's so that he could pay for the sins of men by living the life of a man and yet being without sin. So he would pay for our sins and not his. And, and he was not different from us, but, a, but just like us. He did this so that we could relate to him. Relationship is so important to Jesus, so important to God, that he would go through that process so that we could be in relationship with him intimately know him and love him. Hebrews 2, 16 to 18, and I've got it here again in the message version. He says, it is, it's obvious, of course, that he didn't go to all this trouble for angels. It was for people like us, children of Abraham. That's why he had to enter into every detail of human life. Then when he came before God as high priest to get rid of the people's sins, he would have already experienced it all himself. Experienced what? What did he experience all himself? All the pain. All the testing. And he would be able to help where help was needed. Jesus had to be made like us, his brothers and sisters in every way, so we could relate to him. He wants us to be in relationship with him. He suffered emotional pain, physical pain. He suffered. He was tested and tried, just like you and I. You know, as we look at it, can we say that Jesus understands? Understands what we are going through and what we have been through? Does he understand us? Ask yourself that question. Do you believe, do you believe, just kind of ask yourself right now, do you believe that Jesus knows what you're going through? He's know, he knows what you've been through, and he can relate, and he understands what you've been through. And as we just read, it's because of him going through it that he can be sympathetic and compassionate with us, and that we can absolutely trust him. Well, Jesus' humanity demonstrates three things that I want to look at today that should help us want him, want him to be, and for us to call him our best friend. He understands relationships. Did you know that Jesus had four brothers and at least two sisters, or four half-brothers and at least two half-sisters? In Mark chapter 6, it says, he went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man, because they knew him. They knew Jesus from when he was little. This is his hometown. Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not 
this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph or Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters, plural, here with us? And they took offense at him. So Jesus was part of a big family. How many of you are part of a big family or have been in the past? Me too. Absolutely. I know what it's like. You think Jesus understood what it was like to be in a family of at least, what, six? We had six, seven parents, eight, nine. Can you imagine fighting over the food? I'm telling you, when I, even, even with eight sisters, I had to fight for my food. I mean, with all of us at the table, it was who's going to get the last piece of pie or the last piece of, or actually would have been the last chorizo taco that my mom made. They were so good. But can you imagine Jesus? He grew up in all of that as the older brother. I can imagine Jesus telling Mary on Joseph and saying, hey, this is what Joseph did. Well, how do you know that, Jesus? You weren't there. I just know. And you can imagine them saying, Jesus, would you please stop that? But Jesus grew up a kid, and he had brothers and sisters. He knows what it's like to be a sibling. But he also knew what it was like to be ridiculed, to be talking ba talk badly about. You can imagine what they said about Jesus on the playground when they would talk about he's the one who, whose mother was not married when she had him. Jesus understands relationships. He knew the dynamic of being part of a family. And yet his family, it says in Mark 3, and when his family heard it, they heard that he was casting out demons. When it says, when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. He's crazy, deranged. He's lost his senses. This is his family. Jesus is out there demonstrating his power and casting out demons. And they were saying, hey, for, for, you know, don't mind him. He didn't get enough sleep last night. And they tried to pull him away. Has your family ever not believed in you? Sometimes those who know us know us the best, know all of our weaknesses, and, and it's harder for them to believe in us. Do you think Jesus understands that? Of course he does. He also understands the fact that he was a single man for 33 years. What temptations do you think Jesus is familiar with? Yes, he would have been tempted by the opposite sex, just like any other man. So men, especially young men, I want to encourage you, when you are tempted, you can go to Jesus and talk to him about it. He knows exactly what you're going through. And, and there's nobody on earth who knows it as good as him, as well as he does. Talk to him about it. He knows how difficult it is. He knows what it means to be betrayed and abandoned. He was betrayed by his closest friend, one of his closest friends, Peter. On the night before his death, he was betrayed and abandoned by all of his friends. He also knows what it means to be betrayed by a bride. Jesus is the groom, and we, the church, are his bride. And we have betrayed him, and we have been unfaithful to him. He knows what that's like. So Jesus understands relationship. Is there a relationship right now that you're going through, something that you're involved in right now that's causing you to be hurt, that's difficult for you? Jesus knows what you're going through. And he knows right now that I'm struggling with this fly that keeps coming in front of my face. So if I'm doing this, it's, you can't see the fly. I'm not going crazy, but it's the fly is in my face. But Jesus understands relationships. So if you're struggling in a relationship, if you're, your marriage is struggling, if, if your father and child relationship or mother and daughter relationship is struggling, Jesus knows that. You can go to him and talk to him about that. So Jesus understands relationships. He also understands life. You know, Jesus had a job. Can you believe that? Jesus had a job. And in his day, you were an adult at 12 years of age. So at 12 years of age, Jesus would have begun working under Joseph as a carpenter. 
and learning what it was like to actually work all day and actually build things and sell things and work with customers. He believed that for 18 years of his life, before his public ministry, he had a job. Do you think Jesus understands what it means to go to work and how difficult that is for us? You know, I think about it, and, and I think I'm so glad for the times that I've ac actually had to build something that I had a power saw. Did Jesus have a power saw? You know, he had to do everything by hand. Anthony, he had to use a, a hand saw, and he didn't have a nail gun. I mean, and, and imagine carrying the wood to cut it and all that. I think Jesus was not how we see him in these pictures, this frail man, but strong because he had to work and is used to that. He knew that. Jesus understands life and understands what we're going through. He had to support his family after his father, his earthly father, Joseph, died at a young age. So Jesus had to then become the man of the house. He understood what it meant to have to provide for the family. I'm sure he had to pay taxes and deal with upset customers. He knows what it's like to live a life on this earth. In Hebrews 4.15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus understands life, and he sympathizes with what, we're, with what we're going through. He knows what you need. And finally, he understands pain. And some of you are in pain today, and some of the worst pain is not physical pain, but emotional pain. Would you agree with that? And we can get past physical pain sometimes pretty, after a while it goes away, but the the emotional pain sometimes lasts for a lifetime. In Hebrews 2, 16 to 18, I have that in the message version. It's obvious, of course, that he didn't go to all this trouble for angels. It was for people like us, children of Abraham. That's what we looked at earlier. So that when he came before God as high priest to get rid of his people's sins, he would have already experienced it all himself, all the pain and all the testing so that he would be there when we need him and understand him. Isaiah 53, this is 600 years before Jesus. The prophet Isaiah tells us, he was, Jesus, despised and rejected by men. Despised and rejected. Kids, what about you? Have you been despised or rejected? Have you ever been in, in school and been the subject of, of being bullied? I think Jesus understands what it means to be rejected. Maybe rejected by those who thought they couldn't play with this, this boy who was the product of an unwed pregnancy and birth. Now, when I was a kid, and I was one of the bigger kids in school, so I was in junior high, and something about being one of the bigger kids, if you, if you were one of the bigger guys, you probably understand this, but those people, the other kids in school always want to show that they're stronger and bigger and better than the bigger kid. And so that was something that I experienced because I was 6'2 in eighth grade, and I didn't grow after that. So I was pretty big. And I remember being in seventh grade about six feet tall. And the eighth graders, we went to, I went to a, a school called St. John Vianney's, and, and I used to hate the rainy days because when the rainy days came, we had to stay inside. And when we had to stay inside, we would be roaming the schools of, or the halls of this Catholic school. And I remember one day I was with my friend Joseph, or Joe, and Joe and I, we were walking the halls and just saying, hey, where are the eighth graders? I don't know. Keep an eye out for the eighth graders. And sure enough, coming around the corner, we heard the eighth grader boys. Where is that Hector? Where is he, Hecky? And I remember being scared to death that the eighth graders are here. So I turned and I looked and I saw an open closet. It was a broom closet that Joseph, I said, let's jump in there. We went in the broom closet and closed the door. And they were out there just, and I could hear them talking badly about me, about my sisters, about my family. It was very painful. But you know what was even more painful? It was when my sister Darcy, who was in high school at the time, senior in high school, she found out about these guys bullying me and she came to beat them up. So she came to the school and she says, Hecky, first of all, she called me Hecky in front of everybody. Hecky, where are they? 
I said, Darcy, just go away. And she said, and then Joseph, my friend, pointed them out, and, and she went after them, and I never heard the end of it. But Jesus understands what it means to be rejected and despised, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. A man of sorrows. Jesus wept. He didn't just weep at Lazarus' tomb. We know that Jesus wept blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus wept. He wept over, I'm sure, the death of Joseph. He wept over seeing the pain Mary suffered. He's wept over the things that he experienced. Jesus was a man of sorrows. He understands your pain and your tears. Psalm 56, 8 says, and Tracy passed this on to me as we were preparing for this message. It was a scripture verse that means so much to her. Psalm 56, 8, you have, you have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Put my tears in your bottle. How many tears have you shed in your lifetime? And God has put them in a bottle. They mean that much to him. Your tears, my tears. Is there any better friend? Anyone better that we would want to be in friendship with than Jesus? And he clearly understood the idea of physical pain. He, he's God. Got to select when he would come and die. Why did he choose to come on the earth when crucifixion was the means of execution? Why couldn't he come at a time when it's by injection, lethal injection? Can you imagine just that conversation? You think of Jesus and the Father saying, but I want to go then. When executions are their worst, when there is the most excruciating pain when the execution is on a wooden cross with nails because I want them to know that I understand physical pain he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities that's our sin the punishment that brought us peace the punishment that brought us peace with God was upon him, and he took it. And by his wounds, by the pain that he suffered, we are healed. Is this not someone with whom you would want to be friends and would want to be your best friend? I believe Jesus qualifies. Jesus qualifies as your best friend and mine. So finally, just as we're finishing up, how do we respond to this? How do we respond to all that Jesus has done to demonstrate to you and I that he can relate to us, that we can identify and he can identify with us? Well, how about number one, making Jesus your best friend? Well, you can say that. How many times have you seen maybe your kids' parents do that and say, you know, a five-year-old looking at a eight-year-old girl lives across the street and says, I want her to be my best friend. I mean, it's one thing for us to say that, but it has to be reciprocated, doesn't it? Well, Jesus demonstrated that his desire, his great desire, is to be in relationship with us and to be your best friend. In Matthew 7, 23, and then will I declare to them, I never knew you, Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Can you imagine that? Growing up in church all your life and knowing the name of Jesus and hearing about Jesus, but then Jesus saying, when he comes back and you appear before him, I never knew you. Depart from me. Do you think relationship is important? Do you think being known by Jesus, knowing him and being known by him is important? He's saying it's the most important thing is to know him and to be in that relationship with him. And then John, again, his good friend, tells us in John 15, no longer that Jesus said this about the 12, no longer do I call you servants. He already had servants. 
The angels were his servants. He didn't come for servants. He says, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. I have called you friends. Jesus came to make friends, to be friends with you and me. He wants to be our best friend. So make Jesus your best friend. Number two, talk to him like your best friend. We get so used to sometimes talking in religious language and and we think of prayer as an event. But prayer is a conversation with your best friend. And I want to talk to you, especially if you're younger, maybe you're in high school and you've, you've been coming to church, but you don't know Jesus as your best friend. You know Jesus as somebody you want to worship, but you don't really know him as a friend. I want to encourage you to talk to him. Take some time away from your cell phone. And how about sending a text to Jesus? Yeah, didn't you know there's an app for that? I'm kidding. But still, can you imagine talking to Jesus as often as you text your friends? As often as you text somebody else, can you imagine having that kind of relationship with Jesus? Well, we can. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. What about this? What about every time you send a text, before you send the text, you talk to Jesus about it? Should I send this text, Jesus? What do you think about this? Jesus, what do you think about my friend that I'm about to send this text to? How can I be a better friend? This is what Jesus wants, is that kind of friendship with us, that we talk to him like we would our best friend. In Hebrews 7, 25, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's what Jesus is doing for you and me. He's he's standing as your advocate and mine before the Father. And he's saying to the father, yes, yes, father, I know that he, that he committed that sin. I know that he, he fell into temptation. I know that. But I know how hard it was because I lived through it. And he believes in me and has accepted me and my sacrifice. So his sins are paid for. He, and he's praying for us. Remember when he prayed in John 17 before he left, he prayed that they would be spared from the evil one. He's praying that way for you and me. He's always living to make intercession for you and me. What kind of friend is that? Isn't it great to think that you have Jesus always praying for you? Always. I mean, we can ask, and we've said to people, I'll pray for you, but we forget. I don't think Jesus forgets to pray for you. Jesus deserves to be our best friend. He knows and he understands us. Hebrews 4, 16 says, so then let us with what? Confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. With confidence draw near to this Jesus who loves us so much to receive mercy and that is to not get what we deserve and to also receive grace, to receive what we do not deserve and then also to get help when we need it. Do you need help today? Is there something that that maybe you are regretting having done that you need his mercy for? What about his grace to do what he might be calling you to do and you don't have the power to do it? What about help? Do you need help today? You can go to Jesus and go to him with confidence if you know him as your best friend. So, Let's talk to him this week. Let's talk to him like we would our best friend. Let's make time for Jesus. And if you can't hear him, because you may say, I'll talk to him, and I'm doing all the talking, so what kind of friendship is that? I want to encourage you to spend some time in silence, read a scripture verse, read something about what Jesus did, and ask him, why did you do that? And listen. Jesus will talk back to you. He'll speak to you. He'll communicate with you. He wants to. And four, tell others about your best friend and how great he is. Remember the demoniac? Remember the one who was in Gerasene? He, the, the apostles and Jesus had just shown up on this island, and there was this demoniac who had been just 
tortured all of, all of his life, been filled with this demon, and he, he, was, he tore off the chains. He was so powerful. He, he went around the tombs, it said. He lived among the tombs and without clothes. You can imagine this dirty, filthy, maybe foaming at the mouth man. And Jesus goes up to him. And Jesus calls out the demons, knows them by name, hears their name Legion, and then casts them out of this man. And the man came and was now of his right mind. And we know that the city kind of went crazy, that people could not believe it, what had happened. And this man, who all of his life had been tortured, all of his, all of his life had been living among the tombs, was now of his right mind. Jesus set him free. And what did he want to do more than anything? It says he wanted to go with Jesus. Jesus, can I go with you? Can I be with you? He was clothed and he said, I want to be with you. And Jesus didn't let him. Jesus told him, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. How much has Jesus done for you and for me? Oh, he hasn't delivered me from demons. Oh, yes, he has, if you've trusted in Jesus. Jesus has done so much for us. Can we be like this man? It says that he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Proclaiming throughout the whole city. If you have a good friend, who's done a lot for you, don't you just love to share that with other people and tell them how wonderful your friend is? Well, can we do that about Jesus? Can we just tell others about Jesus? It's so simple, and yet it's so hard sometimes. But let's ask that he help us this week to tell others about our good friend, Jesus. I'm going to ask the, the worship team to come back up and as we just look at the last and final response, and it's three in your notes, but I'm making it four, because I want us to really ask that question, especially those who are online, maybe those of you who are here who have never trusted in Jesus. A response to this message, a response to the word would be to trust him with your life, that you can trust this man who gave everything you can trust him with your life. Many of us here at this church have done that. I know I've done it, and my life was never the same. We can trust him with the controls. We can say, I don't know what my future is going to be like. I don't know what tomorrow is going to be like, but you do. Would you take it? Would you take my life because I can trust you? John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who received him, all who received Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. All they needed to do was to trust him to save them. Hallelujah. Have you put your trust in Jesus? If you haven't, you can today. You can say, I, I, I want to know this person that you're talking about. I want to know this man who would do this for me. I want to trust him. If, if, if that's you, then do that today. Don't let today pass without trusting in Jesus. Psalms 37, Psalm 37, 5. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. So I'd ask you to trust him today. Even those of us who have been walking him, with him for a long time, how can we trust him? We can trust him by giving him our life and maybe doing the things that we otherwise don't want to do. Can we trust him maybe by being in a small group that we can help others walk with Jesus who may have not known him as long as we have? Can we trust him by going out and telling others about him, especially in this age that we're in right now? Can we show him that we trust him to be with us even if we're ridiculed and rejected like he was? I can tell you firsthand that over this last week, last couple weeks, months, I've had to trust Jesus with something that I did not want to trust him with. He was asking me to give up control 
And I didn't want to give it up. I was telling him, I, but I know how to do this. This is what I have done for 30 years. I can do this. I want to do it my way and the way that I know how to do it. And Jesus, I felt the Spirit just basically saying, telling me, do you trust me? Yes, I trust you. Well, then let me be your advocate. Let me be your lawyer. Let me be in charge. Hallelujah. And watch what I will do. It was the hardest thing I ever did. Every day I gave it to him. Every day I took it back. And every day I had to give it back. All day long, back and forth and back and forth. But ultimately I was able to say, by God's grace, it's yours. You deal with it. And he did. He did and much better than I ever could have. I want to call on you today and encourage you. Jesus is telling you to trust him with something. He's calling you to trust him. Trust him today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you, Jesus, that you hear us even now and you're watching out and watching over all of us. I want to give you a chance. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've never said, I want him to be my best friend, you can do that today. You can do that right now. You can say, I need you. I've made a mess of my life. I've trusted in myself. I've done so many things that are wrong, but I trust that you, the God of this universe, became a man so that I could relate to you, and I want to trust you with my life. Would you do that today? Give your life to Jesus, and we'll walk with you in that. Let us know if you've done that. We want to walk with you. So God, I pray that you would be with those who are calling out to you right now and help all of us to trust you with our lives. And Jesus, be my best friend. Amen.